I'm your huckleberry. How's it going? So, the runner-up from the last Twitter poll won this Twitter poll. So here we are, a video about westerns. Now, to clarify, the this idea first came to mind because I recently finished watching Deadwood. Fantastic series, although I gotta say, HBO, you kind of fireflied me at the end there. Not cool. Not cool. But all the same, it really did cause me to sort of uh, look back and think about the sorts of um, entertainment that I've been enjoying and also sort of what it is that sort of draws me to the concept of a Western. Now, I'm not strictly, as you could probably tell from that intro, going to be speaking about the classic conventional style cowboy stories, the ones that were made famous during the 60s, like, you know, things like Gunsmoke and the like, but more the sort of genre dynamic of a Western. Just in the same way that a noir film not doesn't necessarily need to take place in the 30s or 40s, uh, so too do I find that the sort of Western or Western-inspired genre it seems to expand pretty well outside of the sort of conventional norms that we might think of when we think about them. And that when we think about what it means, we find a whole lot more than a simple um, Old West action film full of gunfights. Now, for a bit of background in terms of, like, my engagement experience and interest with this sort of thing, in 2012, I was living down in New Orleans. Now, I was living down there with a, a working character, film actor, uh, one who's been in multiple projects, and honestly, if you watch film or TV, you've probably seen him and didn't even know it. There's a friend of mine named Chris Berry, and I'll link to his own IMDb here, as well as to his Twitter, you go on and follow him, and... Let him know that uh, yours truly sent you. But in that case, um, now, this roommate of mine, while I was living down there, he was a born and raised true blood Texan. And uh, his family went way back, I guess, in Texas. Um, and and he, had, he had just that, you know, that genuine sort of Texas sort of attitude. And it was even a time in which our own discussions, when we were just talking about, uh, you know, character archetypes versus what our own personalities were, uh, he'd consistently tell me things such as, man, I wish you'd grow a beard, you'd play a great cowboy. Now, beyond even this, one of the great things about living down there was that I was living down there on some savings mixed with some other money that I'd come into uh, while he was working as a film actor, which means work on a project, make a bunch of money, and then maybe be, you know, unemployed for a period of time. Now, during the course of this, most of our days were spent uh, thusly. Uh, wake up around whenever the hell we get up. Um, at a certain point, just get some basic breakfast, coffee, and the like, and then begin sort of just sipping beers, smoking weed, and watching movies, and then analyzing those movies in terms of story, character development, character arcs, and most importantly, from our perspective, the performances of the actors involved. Now, this was also the first time I got to see the film True Grit, and I'm not talking about the old school John Wayne film, which I highly recommend you go and check out, but actually the more modern adaptation featuring uh, Jeff Bridges, Matt Damon, and Barry Pepper, to name a few. Now, I really enjoyed the film on a number of levels, and in discussing it with this old school Texan actor friend of mine, um, found a lot out about the, the nature of a good Western, the specific nature of the writing involved in that particular film, as well as being given sort of an opportunity to give a lot more thought to what it is that really makes a good Western story a good Western story. What it is about these sorts of tales that really sticks with us in this respect. Now, amongst these things, to start out with, just on a sort of very topical level, the very notion of the film, the very title of it, True Grit, that basically sums up most of what it is that we oftentimes admire in the cowboy or cowboy-esque character. These are tough individuals, not just tough in the fact that they can take a hit and give one out, or the fact that they can, um, you know, beat all the bad guys, 
But that they are the kinds of characters who can, much like in sort of the more classic Greek literature, the works of Homer and the like, can endure seemingly endless hardship. Nothing phases them. Nothing knocks them off of their trail. Nothing dissuades them from the pursuit of their goals most times, at least in terms of when we have the characters that we want. Yet at the same time, because of the setting, because of the nature of the environment of the Western itself, or in more modern terms, such as with Tarantino's more modern interests, the Southern, which is a you know, sort of a pre-Civil War version of the Western, a la Django Unchained, that within these... We find that the characters are oftentimes so dedicated to the pursuit of their goals, so dedicated to following what they're doing, that they'll sacrifice most anything, up to and including their own lives. But that oftentimes, depending on the character, we will oftentimes find that it's, uh, it takes them quite a bit to get there. Uh, oftentimes the protagonist in a given Western or Western-inspired story isn't really all that interested in hitting the trail and pursuing that goal or going down that road and taking that adventure. They're oftentimes sort of required or obligated into it or goaded into it or forced into it somehow against their own desires and free will. Now, what this sort of dynamic gives us isn't just the notion of a reluctant hero going out on a trail that they were uncertain about, but also it, it demonstrates to us from the very beginning that though the hero in the story has no ambitions to be a hero in any story, when they're tasked with it, when they're forced to do it, rather than shirking off their duties, trying to slip out and get away with uh, you know, getting out of having to do anything at all, they oftentimes grit their teeth and move forward against their own will, against their own desires, against their own better judgment. Oftentimes, they go forward with what they have to do and they get it done, no matter what. Now, this is sort of emblematic of the sort of Central American spirit that we're oftentimes encouraged to sort of celebrate in our considerations of our national character. It's this notion of true grit, which oftentimes seems to separate the Western hero from the more conventional heroic archetype who goes forth and does something in the name of goodness and justice or otherwise for glory and honor. They do it because they just have to. They want to get it over and done with so that they can get back to whatever the hell kind of shit lives they were leading before and just be left alone. Now, this is not a universal archetype within the Western, and to be fair, a whole host of the old-school Westerns from the times in the 60s, when my own father was a big fan of them. It's often that steely-eyed hero who's going to do what's right, because it's, well, it's the right thing to do. Now, even in that, we also have a wonderful sort of character archetype. A character which is presented to an audience, usually men and boys, but to show them the sort of old school virtue to that sort of gritty masculinity. Now, in this notion here, it is within the Western that we also, we also and often find one of the last real bastions where stoic, honorable masculinity can be observed and uh, revered or at least appreciated. Uh, without the necessary context of, oh, that's just not inclusive enough, or, oh, that's just so stale. We don't get this, or at least not as much as with other genres, because there's nothing else you can really expect from a cowboy outside of being gritty, stoic, and masculine. There is no place for a, a, a beta soy boy out on the open range. <laughs> There really isn't. And even in those stories, oftentimes, we will even be presented with characters who are inherently or naturally cowardly or weak or soft. But then we get an opportunity to see how it is that an individual can be hardened and made more than they start out with by virtue of being presented with an overcoming adversity and fear. You know, how oftentimes have you watched a story that is Western or Western-inspired in which, in addition to the gritty, noble, or perhaps uh, unwitting or unwilling hero, you have this other character who is uh, just rife and overrun with their own cowardice, right up until the point that it matters. Now, sometimes when that happens, they fail to meet the, uh, they fail to meet the goal. They fail to actually step up to the plate, at least in the first round. And it is then in the shame that they experience and and that we get to see them experience, that they're driven oftentimes to oftentimes great deeds later on in the stories. Now, even in this, the, the value of that character archetype right there, it shows us not so much that it's a bad thing to be a coward. It shows us actually more that within perhaps all of us, even the most overtly cowardly of creatures, that 
when our feet are put to the fire truly, even if it's just by virtue of the shame of our failures to do so before, that there's always a chance for redemption. And this is another element of the Western that I just really love, the notion of redemption. Even when I'm getting back to that reluctant hero, the one who perhaps doesn't want to go do the right thing, who doesn't want to go save the town, who doesn't want to go beat the bad guy, but goes and does it anyway, that it's this notion of obligation, pushing us forward to be our best selves, that we find so readily available in the genre that is the Western or Western-inspired tale. Now, beyond even this and beyond just this sense of stoic masculinity or the inner strength that men can find when their feet are to the fire, we also have, especially in more modern contexts of Westerns, found a sort of stoic and strong femininity that we can appreciate as well. Now, within the pantheon of American mythology and lore, there's no shortage of manufactured legends of brave, bold, strong women that were sort of created just for the purpose of bringing them into the fold. Molly Pitcher, for existence, which is a revolutionary war legend of a, the wife of a cannoneer who, upon seeing her husband felled by enemy rounds, picked up the ramrod and kept the cannons firing. There's no record whatsoever of Molly Pitcher even existing. In fact, if we look to Revolutionary War records, we find that George Washington's own army oftentimes had to routinely purge itself of camp followers, which was the only place you'd typically find women by virtue of them either just following the army for a place to go or them being whores and comfort girls for the soldiers. In those days, women were not really welcomed on the battlefield at all. However, as we move forward in time and history, we do find examples of amazing women, in real life even, who sort of helped forge the character and nature of the Old West. Now, they weren't this way simply because they wanted to show the men folk that they were just as good, but more that they had to be these ways because this was the nature of the world that they lived in. Now, we can look to Annie Oakley, who was a fantastic uh, show shooter and one of the best marksmen or markswomen of her time. But then, even beyond that, we have the story of Calamity Jane, a character we actually see displayed in Deadwood, uh, acted out by, brilliantly by, well, truth be told, I don't know the actress's name to my shame right now, but I'll put it in a little, there you go, now you know. Anyway, it, fantastic performance, but even more than that, Calamity Jane as a character, and who was at one time a friend of Wild Bill Hickok himself, was herself a rowdy and, um, well, just generally unruly type. A badass of all sorts, known for drinking, cussing, and fighting. She carried her own weapons. She was not afraid to brandish or use them. Now, the specifics of what her character was really molded into in terms of the story of Deadwood as it was on HBO, I can't really say. I haven't looked enough into her to really be certain about that. But all the same, even within that, or taking other roles and aspects from Westerns that we can consider, such as, once again, True Grit, where the uh, main protagonist, not Rooster Cogburn, but the young girl who actually contracts Cogburn to go and find the men she's after, it's even there that we see the real true grit in the story, after all, and spoiler alert, by the end of this story, she not only kills a man, but also loses her arm doing so, which is another element of the Western that we can always appreciate and never really get around, which is sacrifice in the name of pursuit of your goal. Self-sacrifice, the willingness to lose a limb, an ear, a tongue, or teeth. To perhaps lose your life, all of your belongings, and not a, and, and to not just avoid losing yourself in the morning of this, but to actually move forward regardless as though it didn't even matter and it was just cost of doing business to get what you need done. I admire this. Now, even beyond this character, we also have the notions of the whore. Now, granted, typically, most, let's say, feminists especially, probably aren't too keen on the notion of women being presented as either, uh, you know, uh, homestead wives or um, whores, as they often are in these uh, particular genres. But even in both of those particular character types, when it comes to the homesteading wife, you have oftentimes a character who loses her husband and everything around and she's consistently surrounded by threats that she's able to sort of ward off or at least keep at bay until the hero's able to go and do his business. This, of course, presuming that she herself is not the hero in question. But also with the whore. When we get past the sort of typical busty saloon whore character archetype, oftentimes in many of these stories we find that these women are creatures of raw survival. 
survivalists of sometimes the highest order. Not only do they do what they have to do, even though they may not like it to survive, but they also are not willing to take any shit from any man. They oftentimes carry blades and guns of their own, and they control situations in ways that oftentimes the characters who are interacting with them aren't even directly aware of. Now, through these analyses of these different sorts of character types and the ways in which they're sort of reflected in average human nature, and in ways in which that even in the midst of great adversity, danger and toil and struggle and strife, that we can find characters who themselves might not have the greatest of moral compasses still stepping up and becoming admirable characters, stalwart individuals who will move forward in the with the best of intentions for themselves and hopefully everyone around, regardless of circumstance. Now, these are admirable character traits, things that are not just distinctly American, but are distinctly American in the Western sense and the ways that they're presented. It's stoicism, it's boldness, it's strength. These are things which we oftentimes, especially in our modern day and age, really aren't ever really fully encouraged to appreciate to the levels that we really ought to. After all, especially in an era such as ours, where things are continually seeming to go off the rails in one fashion or another, it's important to remember that within ourselves and within those around us, there is more strength than we can possibly imagine, and that oftentimes it's only when our feet are put to the fire that we can really appreciate or understand it. Now, this is kind of a deeper and heavier point, but there are other sides to this sort of genre that I really love and appreciate. Now, if we're going to take this more authentic and classic style, not necessarily, again, the 60s style ones, but even, well, again, focusing on uh, things such as True Grit or perhaps 310 to Yuma, it's another good one, or the Alamo for that matter. Now, if you watch a Western, especially a modern Western, you might notice that there's something kind of funny to the way that they talk. It's almost sort of a, a well, an, an attempted uh, elegance and eloquence and articulation to what the things that they say. Sometimes almost sounding kind of goofy, like the characters are trying really very much hard to sound more articulate and uh, eloquent and educated than they may in fact be. Part of this actually comes from the fact that authentic dialogue, if written for an old Western time or perhaps even Civil War, pre-Civil War era, is one which should be written with fewer contractions than we might otherwise be used to. You will hear more often the words cannot than you will or should hear the word can't. You will rarely if ever hear the words okay as such was a sort of, well, it wasn't a, it hasn't been around forever, let's say that much. But even within that, in the attempts of those characters in those times, and even the stories of the real people who existed back in the day, in this era, where things were rough and tumble, especially further west you go with more sort of frontier era, uh, frontier areas, as it was, lawless sorts of places, barely settled as it was, constantly um, rife with threats ranging from nature to natives to bandits, all these things. There was, it seems in many cases, an attempt to affect an air of civility and civilization. Now this might have come as a result of many of the sort of manifest destiny notions of a white man being a superior creature. But all of the same, the attempts that we see, at least in the conversations we hear, or when we read uh, communications from people from back in those eras, we find this reflected in the Western style by virtue of the fact that even though they might be covered head to toe in dirt and soot and shit and mud, even though they might perhaps live in a very rudimentary circumstance, they may not have shoes, they may sleep under the stars, but they will still attempt at their very most earnest to appear to be intellectual, uh, articulate, intellect, uh, intelligent, and perhaps even educated. An appreciation for the English language as it was spoken back then is the sorts of things that we oftentimes find put into poetic prose in our modern day and age. And this actually is oftentimes sort of reflected in the dress sense, you see, too. Now, granted, the classic cowboy styling oftentimes, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the leather uh, waistcoat, maybe blue jeans or some other kind of slacks, you know, boots with spurs, and then a leather holster with their pistol. But in truth, it actually was a little more subtle, a little more simple, and at times, if they could manage such, a bit more sophisticated if they could help it. Yes, waistcoats were a thing, as were timepieces, much as in back in those days, what little you could have and gain and hold and present was what you were able to basically show that you were worth in a time when most people were worth next to nothing or nothing at all. 
Now, within these attempts to sort of uh, uh, offer some pomp and circumstance, things such as leather holsters, as we often see in most cowboy movies, were not nearly as popular as these films might have you believe. More often than not, these sorts of uh, uh, things were reserved for either wealthier folks, lawmen, or people who've uh, for one, in one fashion or another managed to sort of come by one. More often than not, those who packed iron in those days simply carried them either in a tucked into a normal belt, just uh, tucked right in there, or in a pocket, or in a sash, as uh, Wild Bill Hickok was known to carry. Now, in his case, it was a little theatrical, but then again, once again, we get to this notion of a presentation of self in this earlier time. Now, this was a time before social media. This was a time before mass communication of really any kind. You had the printing press that offered papers, and word of deeds and people would travel all over. But it was more focused on the persona and the deeds and the legend that one cultivated than the sort of uh, hyperbolic tabloid bullshit we oftentimes sort of focus on these days. You'll notice that a reputation is far easier to destroy now than it's ever been before. But back then, it was far more difficult to build one, and the efforts and attempts of an individual within their local area, or as broadly as they could, to build a reputation was one that was measured more by the deeds and the way they comported themselves in public than it was some sort of chatterbox bullshit that perhaps a bunch of whisper campaigns would get around. Now, throughout the dress sense, the language, and the presentation of oneself as an individual in some attempt to gain or court some attention as a person worth respecting, there is an interesting sort of aspect. Now, much as I mentioned before, that holsters as we see them in the films were not necessarily as popular or common as they might have thought, and by the way, most of the people at the OK Corral, well, they were carrying their pistols in their pockets. But all the same... We're offered an interesting opportunity to also examine the nature of, a, of legends versus reality in respect to our national characters and history. When we look at the stories that come out of the Old West and the Frontier era, when we look at our own westerns, be it them in uh, novels or films or television, we can see really what it is that we wish to reflect upon in respect to our national character. And these, of course, are things such as stoicism, heroism, strength, honesty in some cases, but generally honor. In fact, in, in, in a time in which men would shoot one another simply over an accusation of cheating in a card game. Well, the notion of honor, the notion of one's integrity, it seemed to really go in some ways a lot further then than it, uh, well, probably actually did, but in many cases a lot further than it does actually now. Now, this is reflective of the ways in which we as a society tend to look and view our own history. If we ought to consider the Revolutionary War, for instance, most Americans get in their minds these notions of steely-eyed patriots marching boldly into battle against an oppressive regime which was eventually battled back simply by virtue of our gumption. But in truth, the more you look into it, the more you find that a great deal of that is actually just uh, mythologized pig shit. Paul Revere, for instance, never made his midnight ride. That ride was made by four or five or six other people working in teams, Revere himself being stopped along the way by British Army regulars and having his horse and his weapon taken from him and getting a bit of a kicking before he was sent back the way he came. George Washington, as much of a noble individual as he's often painted, was himself actually a land speculator, and one of his big biggest gripes was the fact that the Crown denied him land speculation rights in the Ohio River Valley, which he had discovered while on a military expedition against native tribes. It wasn't until his London brokers shut him off from credit that he even began to consider the notions of independence for the United States, and much the same is the case with the Adams brothers as well as Benjamin Franklin. But in the writing of the history, the legends which people sought to express the generations in the future, so as to give them some sort of archetype, some sort of hero that they might look at. Well, they say a lot about what the designs and mentality of what our national character was meant to be was. And such is very much true even in the modern production of the Western. What is it we find within the stoicism and heroism and strength of these characters? The fallibility oftentimes and the options and choices that they make and the paths they oftentimes take to redemption after go maybe going down the wrong path. What are the sorts of lessons that we find with this? Well, much like with Homer, 
with the Iliad and the Odyssey, we find the notions of uh, strength through the overcoming of adversity invaluable. We can't get enough of that, because it reminds us that if uh, Rooster Cogburn, for instance, can take a series of shots and uh, uh, perhaps uh, find himself in a precarious or a compromising position of this or that, well, he's going to overcome it through simple will and his own true grit. Within this, we find something to really celebrate, not necessarily about the true nature of ourselves, but what it is we genuinely aspire to be. And it's in these archetypes of the pure hero, that steely-eyed cowboy who's going to shoot down the bad guys and then before he leaves, explain to little Timmy, who's living there with his widow mother, well, why it is that he needs to be moving on, because sometimes a man just needs to do the right thing and move on. Or otherwise, then we have the anti-hero, the sort of, um, well, you know, the, the, the Rooster Cogburn character, the, the effectively lawman for hire, bounty hunter type, who's not all that keen on doing the right thing, but will do so when his feet are pushed to the fire, but not until he's been paid and convinced and coerced to get into action. And then, of course, one interesting part of that, too, is the love of a villain. Now, unless you have no blood pumping through your veins whatsoever, when you watch a film, if you find yourself confronted with a genuinely appealing villain, it's sometimes hard not to root for them just a little bit. Maybe just because you like the character, or if nothing else, you can't wait to see the next sequence that they're in. But within the Western, we oftentimes find that those who should be the villains are, in fact, the heroes. Billy the Kid has been mythologized throughout the, uh, throughout the American ages now in numerous fashions, uh, books, movies, literature, and all of that. Despite the fact that he was a cold-blooded killer, he was a criminal and a murderer. Another one for this would be uh, Jesse James, recently, well, relatively recently, actually, um, uh, portrayed by Brad Pitt in the assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. Now, by all conventional metrics, Robert Ford being the man who gunned down a, a, a train robber and a criminal and an outlaw such as Jesse James should often, at least according to civil society, be kind of regarded as, well, if not a hero, something of a good guy. But instead it's the coward Robert Ford, and it's the telling of the legend of Jesse James the outlaw. In this we sort of are offered an opportunity to sort of indulge in that sort of darker aspect of ourselves, the consideration of being the outlaw, the, um, the, the odd man out, the man against the world. And we see this even reflected now, too, in even modern tellings of stories, such as Sons of Anarchy, which focuses on a murderous outlaw biker gang who we can't help but love and support. It's within these that we get so many opportunities to really analyze and consider some of the deeper natures to these uh, aspects of our character. And it's not just limited to the westerns such as uh, True Grid or 310 to Yuma or Deadwood or any of these. We see them reflected other places as well. One of my favorite series of all time, one of my favorite works of fiction period, Cowboy Bebop. Now, where it can be classed, yes, as a science fiction space tale, or a sort of noir bounty hunter detective story, while those are both absolutely true and correct, it's in the name, Cowboy Bebop. It's meant to be a space western, and you see this reflected in the character archetypes of Spike, Faye, and Jet. And with Jet, you have the grizzled old ex-cop who's been through the ringer a few too many times to really want to keep jumping into it any more than he has to. And right now, he's just looking to make his way as a bounty hunter. Then you have Spike, the criminal type, who uh, made his way on Mars, on the rough streets of Mars, as an outlaw himself, before finally faking his own death and moving on to become a bounty hunter. And then, of course, Faye Valentine, a oozing sex appeal, but uh, hardly uh, trustworthy in any conventional sense. The Western themes and elements within that show, in my opinion, are something, well, there's, there's some of the best elements to it. They're what make it part of one of my favorite all-time uh, works of fiction, period. And it's because it blends not just the elements of sci-fi and noir that I like together, but it does so with this underlying current of a Western. Stoic, uh, almost iconic, unflappable characters who can be thrust into any form of adversity or danger and will somehow find their way to the end, even if they don't like it and even if it comes at great personal cost. But another element to this, something which actually really only occurred to me tonight before making this video, another place in which this same sort of series of dynamics plays out beautifully is in the film Logan.
Now, in an era in which I personally would love to see more Western films coming out amidst the torrents of comic book superhero movies that we're getting, Logan stands apart. It's not like any of the others. It's barely even an X-Men film. In fact, in my opinion, it's barely a superhero or comic movie at all. If anything, it's a Western, a modern Western, or a futuristic Western. It's even set in the Southwest, going um, straight from the Southwest and parts of Mexico straight up into the Dakotas. Now, beyond just the sort of progression that we see of an unwilling, unready hero, one who doesn't want to be a part of anything, who's taking on duties because he has to, but not because he wants to, but because he's obligated to, who's biting the bullet every day, day in, day out, drinking himself into a coma as he's just sort of preparing to basically die. And then he finds himself thrust into one more serious adventure in which not only does he have to protect the ones that he loves but he has to sort of pick up the iron again he's got to get back to the old ways it's something that he was trying to leave behind but he was forced back into it and throughout the film as he grows to basically understand his own nature a little more as he's uh, forced to sort of set his own interests aside and in interest of trying to help what was a relative stranger at the beginning of the film, somebody who came to mean the world to him by the end of it. I mean, if you can watch Logan and not tell me that that's a Western-inspired story of an old-school badass who's going out for one more ride, well, then you, you and I were probably not watching the same film. Now, throughout all of this, and I suppose to sort of sum this up, I think that ultimately the Western is an invaluable genre. I think that the stories that are able to be told by virtue of the settings, character archetypes, the sorts of things we've come to rightly expect of such a genre, it speaks to so many of the better and worse elements of our characters. Within the villains and the bad guys of these stories, we're offered the opportunity to examine the concepts of greed and uh, fecklessness and uh, deceit and self-interest and how such can be plied to great self-gain but at the cost of others and how if it goes too far there will be someone someone stoic someone heroic someone strong possessed of an inner strength and an inner drive who may or may not even want to be part of it but who will rise up hopefully to defeat this evil we get in this, we're offered opportunities to reflect on things like stoicism. We're offered opportunities to reflect on things such as character and grit. The, the frontier mentality, somewhat referenced in my previous video on guns, but more in a positive manner, the sort of can-do spirit, the, 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 the willingness to sacrifice in order to gain what, what one is going after. The willingness, for instance, to, uh, to allow the loss of one's own limbs or life. So long as that the right thing happens at the end. This self-sacrifice, this, this well, positive, non-toxic masculinity. I think it's indispensable. And I think it speaks to the finer natures oftentimes of the American character. Because though we would like to think that within a civilized society, we are offered the opportunities to sort of let go and let our guard down and stop being so hard and grisly. The truth is, is that... Um, what separates us from lawlessness, what separates us from the wilds, is a far thinner uh, thread than we might like to acknowledge. And then, I suppose in one final sort of analysis, consideration of this genre and idea, we often, we are also, in this case, oftentimes offered an opportunity to examine the trade-offs that come with what some might call a libertarian paradise or an ANCAP paradise, uh, the sort of lawless frontier notion, the place in which the notion of American rugged individualism is ultimately born from. Within it, though, we see that, you know, it offers an opportunity, an equality of opportunity unlike any other to where you live or die based on what it is you're capable of doing. It also shows us that um, such as... Well, that just lays the groundwork in a sense, I guess, to uh, set the stage so that the strong may overtake the weak and nothing may be done about it. It's a, an environment in which might can make right. And that if one wants to hold on to what they've got, they might end up having to spend more time defending it than they can cultivating it. 
There is so much to the American character that is encapsulated in the concept of the Western and the Western's influence on other fiction throughout the canons that we have. And so I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. I mean, what's your favorite Western, right? What's your favorite, uh, what's your favorite story? Or perhaps even better, what sorts of stories have you found in which these sorts of elements have sort of seeped in and impacted the, the storytelling of the characters? And how has that impacted you? How have you maybe found your viewing of stories impacted by these sorts of natures. And do you think this is a distinctly American thing? Or is it perhaps a modification of something that came before? All this and more, I want to hear your thoughts, so give me your comments. And of course, as always, give this video a like if you enjoyed it. It is like if you didn't, because it doesn't matter who gives a shit. But all the same, share it around. Let me know your thoughts here. And um, let's keep the conversation about this going, because honestly, if there's one thing we know is that the trend of superhero movies, though it's not going to last forever, well, though it could last forever, it won't be the singular thing, and my serious hope is that uh, Westerns, you know, they make some kind of a comeback in one way or another. All the same, though, as usual, links down below to all of the relevant things. If you like this channel and the work I do, you want to support it, there's plenty of opportunities. Just go look at some of those links. Also, thank you to my patrons who've uh, made this channel possible and continue making it possible, who've stuck with me as I sort of pivoted off from the regularity of insipidity politics off to the things that I find more interesting. That being the case, freaking happy trails, and I know this hat didn't really cut it, but all the same. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting, or being lied about, don't deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating. Dreams your master. If you can think and not make thoughts rain, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can bear to hear the truth you've spoken, twisted by knaves to make a trap for fools, or watch the things you gave your life to broken and stoop and build them up with worn out tools. If you can make one heap of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start again in your beginnings, and never bring a word about your loss. If you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they're gone, and so hold on when there's nothing in you except the will which says to them, hold on.